Amen. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13 is where we've been starting. Notice what the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, Now abides faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. As we've said every, every time, we pretty much instinctively, all humans instinctively know this. Uh, it was evidenced, you know, uh, now we have a little technology. and I mean, soldiers on the battlefield have known it for years. When people's lives are about to end, almost all of them are thinking about someone they loved. You know, tell my wife I love her. Tell my kids I love her. Tell my mom I love them. Uh, it seems like everything gets into focus and becomes very clear about really what's important in life. We noticed in 9-11 when the attacks and people would call from the airplanes, you know, you can Google these and find the messages they left. Nobody was thinking about what's going on at work, how much money do I have in the bank, I wonder what my GPA is. Everybody was thinking about somebody they loved or somebody that loved them. The Bible says this is the greatest thing. Love is the greatest thing. And it teaches that, that this is an overriding principle. And it tells us here in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, you understand this wasn't written in chapter and verse, so it's in the same discourse where he says the greatest of these is love. And then he says, eagerly pursue and seek to acquire this love. Are operating in this love, make it your aim, your great quest. So we should be aiming to get better and better and sweeter and sweeter and more adept at working in the God kind of love. Can I get an amen from you? And if you'll hear the Word of God, meditate the Word of God, pray for the Holy Spirit to help you, we'll all just get better and better and it's going to impact your life. And I can promise you it's already impacted your life for good or for bad. It's already impacted your life. And it's causing, you know, if you look back over your life, your ability to understand and implement the truth about the God kind of love. And you understand the Greek language just has more than, Greek language has more than one word for love. But the English language, we just call it love. And we love ice cream and we love our kids. And so we, we must know that there's a different level in this. So this kind of love that the Bible talks about is agape. It's an unconditional love. It's the kind of love that God had for us. He commended his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus prayed for the very people that crucified him and tortured him to death. And he forgave them and prayed for God to forgive them. It's a totally different level of this God kind of love. And so we want to find out how this operates because it impacts every area of our life. In fact, Jesus' half-brother was James. And in James 2.8, he called it this, if you fulfill the royal law, everybody say the royal law. According to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself you do well. So he says it's a royal law. The word royal here, uh, basilikos, means, means it's the sovereign law. It's the supreme law. It's the supreme law. It impacts every other spiritual law. It impacts your giving. It impacts your faith. It impacts the peace you have in your life. And it, it impacts everything. So it's the supreme, the sovereign law. And it's the, the highest law because God himself is love. And this great kind of love that comes into us as believers, Romans 5, 5 says, when we're born again, this love is actually shed abroad in our hearts. So you have the capacity to operate in this love and grow in this love. But it's not natural human love. Natural human love, you know, people say they fall in and out of it. That's not the God kind. The God kind of love doesn't change. It's eternal. It never fails. It never gives up. It's this supernatural kind of love, and we have the ability to love this way. So it's kind of summed up. I like this. We, we said that this impacts every area of your life. Notice how Peter said it, inspired by the Spirit, 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. In the same way you married men should live considerately with your wives, with an intelligent recognition of the marriage relation, honoring the woman as physically the weaker, but realizing that you are joint heirs by the, by the, of the grace, God's unmerited favor of life, in order that your prayers may not be hindered and cut off. Notice Amplified adds this, otherwise you cannot pray effectively. So he said, you know, in this, in this relationship, uh, you, you gotta get this right and then verse 8, it says, finally, all of you should be of one mind, united in spirit, sympathizing with one another, loving each other as brethren in one household. So you can see that this impacts everything. And then in verse 9, he continues on, and notice what he says here. Be compassionate. Then in verse 9, he says this, never return evil for evil, or insult for insult, scolding, 
tongue lashing, berating, but on the contrary, contrary means the opposite, do the opposite. Blessing, praying for their welfare, happiness and protection and truly pitying and loving them. So he says, there is another spiritual law. And if you will learn to operate in this, when people are insulting you, berating you, hollering at you, they're doing things that are hurting you, there's another law. And if you want to have the blessing of God in your life, then you have to learn not to return evil for evil or insult for insult, but you pray for their welfare. You actually bless them. And it says for their protection, pitying and loving them. And then notice what, it, you know, when you begin to do that, it impacts everything. So there's another spiritual law that you put at work that's higher than what's down here. And it causes then you to operate in the blessing and the peace of God in your life. Can I get an amen? And because none of us want our prayers to be hindered. None of us want our prayers to be stopped. So he said, you got to do this in your marriage. You got to do it in your relationships. So your prayers won't be hindered because faith makes prayer work and prayer don't work without faith. And faith operates by love. Can I get an amen from you? All right. So I'm just going to kind of give you three things as I talk about this, as we bring it to a conclusion, but, but very interesting. Uh, love is not prideful. This is number one. Love is not prideful. Everybody say not prideful. In other words, love has a, a humble attitude. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5 says it this way. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor bowls over with jealousy. Is not boastful or vainglorious. Does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with what? Inflated with pride. It says love is not that way. Now, sometimes people get confused about really what is pride. What, what is that? And, and they get confused and they think somebody with a spirit of faith is prideful. Somebody who's bold is prideful, but that's not really, that's not true. In fact, you can see this uh, in, in David. Do you remember David goes out, he, 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 he's gonna fight Goliath. Now he's about five foot two, 17 years old, just a kid, teenager. And he goes out to this, champion of the Philistines and the whole time before he goes out there he's been telling Saul and everybody the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear he'll deliver me from this this uncircumcised Philistine then he goes out and he tells the giant hey you come to me with a sword and a spear but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel guess what you're fixing to lose your head today and I'm going to feed you and I'm going to feed the whole army over there to the beasts of the field and the birds of the air today. Amen. Wow. Now, a lot of people think, man, how bragging, who do you think you are? But you understand David wasn't talking about because of his ability. He said, the Lord. Everybody say, the Lord. The Lord. Yeah, he was trusting the Lord who delivered him out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He said, this day the Lord's going to deliver you into my hand. His confidence, his boldness, he had a spirit of faith in God. And we have to have a spirit of faith in God. It's not you. You're not a hot shot. You may think you're a hot shot. Let me tell you, you're not a hot shot. Are you here? No, we, we have to trust God to help us in every area of life. Apart from him, we're nothing. Are you here? And we have to have this right attitude about it. David's attitude, he, you know, he didn't go out there and he didn't tell Saul, you know, I know I'm five foot two, but listen to me. This body is a lethal weapon. <laughs> he didn't say that, did he? He didn't say, have you ever saw me shoot a slingshot? I'm the best there is. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't talk about himself. He said, the Lord is with me. God is with me. Who is he to defile the armies of the living God? And our attitude should be no matter what comes in the world, no matter what circumstance we're facing, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. I said, if God be for us, how many of you know God's for you? Amen. I said, how many of you really know God's for you? Then, then if God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? You say, well, you don't know what's happening in the world. I do, but I know God. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Hello. And yet that's a spirit of faith, but it's not dependent upon you and how great you are and how smart you are. It's depending on God.
Philippians chapter 3, notice how it says it here. I like this. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, says, uh, put it up there for us, guys. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Everybody say, no confidence in the flesh. 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 We're not supposed to be counting in ourselves. We're not supposed to be saying, boy, we're so smart. We've got it all together. In fact, it's interesting. The, the Greek word for pride means to be blown up or inflated, to overestimate your own importance or opinion. Be, be inflated, to overestimate your own importance or your own opinion. That's what pride is. We, we're not supposed to have confidence in our, in our own ability and how smart we are. You don't understand the family lineage that I came from. I'm really special. Yeah, I know. Your family tree has some fruits, nuts, and flakes in it, just like everybody else's tree. Are you here? Notice Luke chapter 14. Notice Jesus said a whole lot about this. You know, it would interest, it'd be interesting. Just go through the, the Gospels and read what Jesus said about humility and about pride. It's very interesting. Because this, this aspect of the God kind of love, being humble in dealing with people and your circumstances and giving yourself to humble tasks and not being full of yourself, this is so different from culture. I said it's different from our culture. I mean, our culture, they seem to be so full of themselves. Luke chapter 14, notice what Jesus said. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, ranked below others who are honored or rewarded. And he who humbles himself keeps a modest opinion of himself and behaves accordingly will be exalted, elevated in rank. Who said that? Jesus said that. Jesus said that. And, and it says, for everyone. How many is everyone? How many of you in here would be included in everyone? Amen. And he says, everybody who does this, everybody who humbles himself, they're going to be honored or rewarded. Everybody who does that. But he said, if you, have a, if you think you're something special, then, then it's not going to work out quite the way you think it. In, in Romans chapter 12, this is interesting. Romans 12, verse 16 Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty or snobbish or high-minded or exclusive, but readily adjust yourself to people and things and give yourselves to humble tasks. What? Never overestimate yourself. Never what? Never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own conceits. Don't overestimate yourself. Don't be, don't be thinking, I'm so special. I tell you what, you, you just don't understand how much education I have. You don't understand all about how great that I am and the talents and skills that I have. No, you're not supposed to be focused on yourself. And no matter what you came from and no matter how much education you have and no matter how wealthy your family was or what your family tree was like, you better get your dependence on God because all of the things you're trusting in can leave in a moment. Are you here? to get your eyes on the Lord because apart from him we're nothing pride destroys marriages and businesses and relationships and friendships and families and on and on and on it goes pride and we need to stay out of that in fact Proverbs 13 10 notice what it says here by pride comes nothing but strife strife but with the well advised is wisdom but with a well-advised is wisdom. Pride can greatly hinder God's blessing in your life. In Luke chapter 18, this is good. Luke chapter 18, I love this story of Jesus. He starts it off this way. Two men went up into the temple to pray. See, he's dealing with, dealing with these inward issues. Two men went up in the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. The tax collectors were despised. They were considered to be turncoats or traitors against the nation because they worked for Rome, taking up taxes, and they knew their community and they knew who had money and, and knew more about it. So, and anything they got above it, they could keep for themselves, and that was their wages, and the people despised them. And so he's telling this because all of the Jewish people despised these guys. 
And he said, two went up in the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Verse 11. The Pharisee took his stand ostentiously, ostentatiously. In other words, he stood out there in front of everybody, kind of held his chin up before he was going to pray. And he began to pray thus before and with himself, God, I thank you, I'm not like the rest of men, extortioners and robbers and swindlers, unrighteous in heart and life. They are dirt bags. Adulterers are, I'm so thankful, I'm even not like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I gain. But the tax collector, merely standing at a distance, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he kept striking his breast and he said, Oh God, be favorable, be gracious, be merciful to me, the especially wicked sinner that I am. I tell you, Jesus said, this man went down to his home justified, forgiven, and made upright and in right standing with God rather than the other man. For everyone, here's that word again, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Huh? See, when, when you approach God, you can't be bragging on how good you are. Lord, I just want to talk to you. You know that I have really tried to be a good person. I have really been spiritual. I haven't been church even during the coronavirus. I was always there. You know that I tithe and how good I am. You know what an amazing person I am. I read my Bible every day, Lord. And you start bragging on yourself. He said, that's a waste of time. You got to depend upon what God has done for you. You go to the Father in the name of Jesus, not your name. You don't go dragging in there about how good you are and what all your performance has been. You depend upon the blood of Jesus Christ. By that blood, you've been justified and made righteous and upright before God. There's nothing you've done that made you right with God except Jesus and put faith in his atoning sacrifice. And when you come to God before him, you don't come bragging about your great stuff. You come bragging on God. You come bragging on the blood of Jesus. Can I get an amen from you? He said, that's the attitude, a person who humbles himself and said, I know apart from you, I'm nothing. I don't deserve anything. I'm not bragging on me, but I'm bragging on you. You're my God. I thank you for the blood of Jesus that's speaking for me today. And I know I've blown it and I've messed up and I've sinned and I've fallen short, but thank God for the precious blood of Jesus. Thank God for your great mercy. I'm depending upon your grace and not my performance. And that's the attitude we have to have when we go before God. Romans chapter 12, verse 16, I like this. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. Romans 12, 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, snobbish, high-minded, exclusive, but readily adjust yourself to people and things and give yourselves to humble tasks. Never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own conceits. We got to always keep that in our heart. Pride destroys marriages. Pride, only by pride comes contention. Pride can hinder God's blessing in your life. 1 Peter chapter 5, I like this scripture. Notice this one again. 1 Peter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger and of lesser rank, be subject to the elders the ministers and spiritual guides of the church, giving them due respect and yielding to their counsel. Clothe, apron yourselves, all of you, with humility. What? Humility as the garb of a servant, so that its covering cannot possibly be stripped from you with freedom from pride and arrogance toward one another. For God sets himself against the who? Against the proud, the insolent, the overbearing, the disdainful, the presumptuous, the boastful, and he opposes and frustrates and defeats them, but he gives grace, favor, blessing to who? How many of you could use some grace, favor, and blessing? I, I mean, you see, you, you know what you want your kids to have? You want them to have the grace, favor, and blessing of God on their life. That's what you want. Because there ain't nothing that you can give them that'll make them successful apart from the blessing and touch of God. You get out from the blessing and touch of God, there's no real success. There's no real peace. There's no real joy. There's no real happiness. 
and culture has proved this over and over and over and over with the rich destroying their lives and the famous taking their lives and committing all kinds of atrocities and suicide and sin and addicted to everything in the world. What will really make you successful is the grace and blessing and peace and joy of the Lord that's on your life. And he says, therefore, humble yourselves, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God that in due time he may do what? How many of you want God to do that to you? How many of you want a little exaltation from the Lord? Then we got to back off of this, boy, we, we got to get focused on this, this concept, this part of love that says we're humble and we keep that attitude and we're dependent upon God. What are the rewards of? What are the rewards of walking in humility before God? Proverbs 22, 4, listen to this. This is why this aspect of love is so important. Proverbs 22, 4 says it this way. By humility and the fear of the Lord, humility and the fear of the Lord, what happens? Riches, honor, and life. Everybody say riches, honor, and life. That's just saying that, that this, this touch of God, this blessing of God will be impacted mightily. It's going to impact your life if you learn to really operate in this aspect of love that's not self-exalting, that's not took, looking at you and saying how great you are and you get up in the morning in the mirror and say, oh my gosh, God did good, good, good. Huh? No, you're saying, I trust the Lord. Anything I have, anything I've got, anything good that's ever came out of me came from the Lord God Almighty by the power of His Holy Spirit and His grace and mercy. That's the attitude we need to have. Amen? And it says if you'll have that attitude, it, it does something. It brings riches and honor, and it's going to bring real life to you. Second thing is this, love adapts. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 Notice what it says here. Wives, be subject, be submissive, and adapt yourselves. Everybody say adapt. Adapt yourselves to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. You're not doing it just for your husband. You're doing it as a service to who? To the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, himself the Savior of his body. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for, that, that was really bad, y'all don't pay attention. <laughs> gave himself up for her. her. He, he gave up what he liked for her. For her. So he's, he's just saying, I'm adapting to you. What, I, I want to be a blessing to you and she's adapting to him. She wants to be a blessing to him. And if you get in a marriage like that where, where she's adapting to you, wants to bless you, and he's adapting to her, I, I mean, it just causes marriage and family to turn out really good. Amen. Love adapts. You know, I heard about this, this man. I mean, he was a believer, but um, he was very, very, he just loved money. I mean, he, it was just like an idol in his life. And so he was kind of a miser and greedy and, and uh, he made a lot of money, millions of dollars. And, and so he got on, he was dying and, and he called his wife in and he said, I, I want you to promise me something. I just, when, when, when I die, I want you to put, uh, I want you to put the, 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 all of the money that I have in the casket with me. She said, what? Yeah, I want all the money in there with me. I want to tell you, it make me, it's going to make me feel secure. And I just want you, to, I want you to promise me you're going to put all the money in there with me. She said, well, all right, I promise. I'll put all the money in there with you. So he died. And so they're getting ready to have the funeral. And one of her friends is there at the funeral with her. This lady says, you're really not going to put, a, I mean, how much, how much money did he have? She said, well, he had $20 million. Well, you're not really going to put that $20 million in there and send that with him. She said, yeah, I really am. She said, oh, my. So they have the funeral service. They go out, and he's getting ready to be buried, and they drop him in the hole. She says, wait a minute. And she goes up and opens the lid. She made out a check for $20 million and dropped it right in there, and they shut the lid and covered it up. She was adapting herself and obeying her husband, wasn't she? Romans chapter 12, verse 10 
love one another with brotherly affection as members of one family giving precedence, that means priority and showing honor to one another. Giving precedence or priority to one another. You know, adapting is not difficult when you're not prideful and self-centered. When you're fully yourself, you're self-centered, it's gonna be my way, I want this, I want, this is what we're gonna do, then you're not adapting. But if you get out of this self-centeredness, if you're not full of pride, you can adapt immediately. I mean, when Velda and I married, it's been over 40 years, 41 something years ago now. And uh, so we had saved up, we were gonna go on a big, a big honeymoon. And so uh, I was off for the weekend and we got married on Friday night. I didn't have to go back to work till Monday, so we had our big, uh, you know, honeymoon, and we went to Six Flags on Saturday, and uh, I mean, we splurged, baby. <laughs> and uh, so then on Monday, it was time for me to go back to work, and I had to be at work at seven, so I got up early, and I'm getting ready to go. And uh, so I'm getting ready to go to work, and I come in, and she has a breakfast made. I mean, full breakfast. She's raised on a farm. So every morning, her mother would get up and fix bis biscuits and eggs and bacon. So she got up, she fixed biscuits, eggs, and bacon, and I mean, the whole thing. So I, I ate the breakfast, you know. And then before I was leaving, I said, you know, really, you don't have to get up early and, and, and do that every morning. I can just eat cereal. And you know what? She adapted immediately. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I've never mentioned it again. It's been 41 years and I've ate cereal for 41 years. <laughs> you talk about adapting, baby. Woo! So, I mean, it's really not all that hard. Hallelujah. What movies does your spouse like? We don't, we don't like the same movies. We went to the movies some when we were dating, but it, back then it, it was drive-in theaters. And I, I really didn't <clears throat> watch the movie. So, I mean, I didn't realize we, we don't, I, I like movies where, where the good guys are shooting the bad guys. And if it's got John Wayne in it, that's just a plus. But she has a different style about movies and she likes some of these chick flicks. And so, you know, I don't know if we'll ever have movies again in America, but if we ever do, we, I, I go to movies that she likes and she adapts. She goes to some movies that I like. But, but, I mean, you put the other one first, you give them priority. Uh, what kind of restaurant does your wife like to eat in or your, or your husband like to eat in? What kind of food do they like? What activities do they like? What vacations? What furniture? You, you adapt to them. You put the other one first. You think about them. Sometimes parents need to adapt to their children. Are you here? I mean, yeah, I know that you're tired. I know school just started, but you know, kids, I mean, you, you can't always just come home from work if you got a little boy or you got a little girl when you come home from work. You can't just say, man, I'm tired. I'm just gonna sit here. And you know, maybe you've been busy. I'm just gonna sit here and relax. You're just gonna have to play. I don't have time to throw the ball. I don't have time to play outside. I can't play a board game. No, sometimes you need to put your flesh under and you need to do a little sacrifice for the kids. And sometimes you need to play a board game with them. And sometimes you need to take the kids to a movie they want to see. I said a movie they want to see. See, I take my grandkids to movies they want to see. And I tried to do that with my kids. We didn't go to the movies much, but I, what do they want to see? Am I interested in it? No, but I'm, I'm adapting to them. I want to make them happy. Right? Now, that doesn't mean you always adapt to your kids. Some people, the kids actually run the whole family and the whole family schedule is all just whatever that six-year-old says, that's the way life will be. But sometimes you can eat where they want, but not always. The kids don't always get their way. I said they shouldn't always get their way. And it's all right for mom and dad to have a date night without the kids there. Amen. And, and, and sometimes, you know, kids want to sleep in the bed with, with uh, mom and dad all the time. You need to kick them out. I said, you need to kick them out. I'm coming over here. You need to kick them out of the bed. That will mess up your sex life. That doesn't mean if they have a bad dream or they're upset that you can't have them come and get in bed with you, but hey, that's mom and dad's bed. 
and they can adapt to that. Say, so, oh, I want to be in there with mama. Well, you go in there and cry because you ain't getting in here. Amen. You got to learn to adapt. Some couples can't have sex because their kids are always sleeping with them. Well, let them, let them adapt to their own room, their own bed. Amen? amen. I, I was expecting a little deeper amen from that. <laughs> amen. All the men said. Amen. All right, there we go. Now we're, do, now we're doing all right. Now you're doing all right. The ladies are mad at me, but the men love their pastor. <laughs> number three, listen to this. Number three, last one. Love, lo, love overlooks other people's faults. It overlooks other people's faults. How many of you know that everybody's got faults except you? <laughs> no, I mean, we all got faults, don't we? Love overlooks others' faults. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, the Amplified Bible says this. Do not be, it's not conceited, arrogant, inflated with pride. It's not rude or unmannerly. It does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's in, love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. It's not self-seeking. It's not touchy or fretful or resentful. Notice this part. It takes no account of the evil done to it pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Doesn't even pay attention to it. When the spouse is gripey or when somebody's rude, you, you just overlook it. You, you overlook other people's faults. If you want life to go smooth and not always be in conflict, some people are always mad at somebody about something stupid. Their whole life is that. They're mad at the people they work for. They're mad at their spouse. They're mad at, they're mad at somebody in town. They're mad at somebody in traffic. They're always, their life is always upset and in turmoil because they don't overlook anything. Man, you got to overlook stuff. Everybody say, overlook it. Amen. Just overlook it. Quit being touchy and fretful and resentful. Man, get over yourself. Your opinion's not the only one that matters. Y'all quit shouting and sit down out there. Man, overlook some stuff. My wife has to overlook stuff about me all the time. And I've overlooked stuff about her once or twice in these 41 years. <laughs> That's part of life. You know, there, there was an old poem that said this. It said, to keep your marriage brimming with love in the loving cup. Whenever you're wrong, admit it. Whenever you're right, shut up. Everybody say, overlook it. Amen. And you'll have a lot more peace in your life. You can ruin any marriage, any, any relationship by focusing on what you don't like that the other person does or did, and then you just dwell on that. You just zero in on this. I don't like this about you. I don't, I don't like this about you. People will do things intentionally and unintentionally that are going to hurt you. You need to forget it. You need to overlook it. You need to stop getting offended because that's going to mess up your life. That's part of this, this supreme law. And you need to learn to live to where you're not offended or mad at people and you forget it. Let it go. Bless those that curse you, pray for them, that despitefully use you so you can operate in the blessing of God. Amen? Why? Because there's another law, baby. There's another higher law. And I don't have to get even with people. And I don't have to take vengeance on people because I got a God and he keeps a good score and he's going to always bless the righteous. And if you'll obey his word, he already said you could inherit a blessing. And part of that is, man, you got you to just let it go. Everybody say, let it go. Colossians chapter 3, verse, verse 13 and 14, last scripture. Be gentle and forbearing with one another, and if one has a difference, a grievance or a complaint against another. You ever had a grievance or a complaint against somebody? I said, have you ever had a grievance or a complaint against somebody? Some people have complaints all the time. Readily pardoning each other, even as the Lord has freely forgiven you, so must you also forgive. And above all these, put on, above all of this, because this is a royal law, this is the supreme law, and it's gonna affect everything in your life. Above all of this stuff, put on and enfold yourselves with the bond of perfectness. Put on love and enfold yourselves in love because love is the bond of perfectness. 
which binds everything together completely in ideal harmony. How many of you want ideal harmony in your life? You want it in your marriage. You want it in your business. You want it in your relationships. He tells you what to do. Above all things, put on this, this love and enfold yourselves with it. If you, if you got a grievance, you got to complain against somebody. Man, forget it, let it go. Well, they didn't ask me to forgive them. Well, forgive them anyway. He didn't say if they ask you. Are you here? And if you'll do this, you're tapping into a higher law. And it, gover it governs everything. It's the royal law. And it governs everything. And you just let it go. And you just say, Lord, I just bless these people. I bless them in the name of Jesus. I pray for them. I, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe, maybe, maybe the devil's messing with their mind. Maybe they think something that's not true. But I just bless them and I pray for them and I ask you to bless them. The Bible says, why would you do that? So you yourselves can, can receive a blessing bringing welfare and happiness and peace. If we'll learn to operate in this, in this royal law, it changes everything. It brings peace to your life. It brings peace to your life. It brings joy to your life. It brings the blessing of God to your life. So let's, let's do that. Can I get an amen from you? Thanks so much for watching. If this message blessed you, don't forget to share it with your friends and family and click subscribe. For more information, you can head over to victoryfamilychurch.com or click the link below.